Radio, so welcome to today's Q&A session on conditional purchase records. What I've basically done is asked around our team at some of the questions that we get asked by staff over the counter and put those into a little um, PowerPoint. So first of all, I would like to acknowledge country. In the spirit of reconciliation, New South Wales State Archives acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. I would also like to do some thank yous before we start. Um, I particularly want to thank those who have so generously shared the knowledge that they have about land records that we can then pass on to you. The three people I'd like to mention in particular are Dr. Terry Cass, Stephen Ford and Vicky Eldridge. Thank you to all of those. I would also like to thank all those visitors to the reading room who have shared their conditional purchase success stories with me so that I've actually got examples to show you today. And I would like to thank the New South Wales Land Registry Services for permission to show you examples of Crown plans in this talk today. So here we have an image of people getting set to clear the land. So today's talk will be about what a conditional purchase actually was, what are the conditions, when did it operate, what size of land could you actually purchase, what were the costs, who was eligible, including um, minors and women, could conditional purchases be mortgaged or transferred, and I'd like to apologise to all those customers who came in and said, my great grandfather sold his conditional purchase. And I would say, no, he can't sell it, but you can't sell it, but you can transfer it. How do you know if your ancestor had a conditional purchase? Finding out the portion number in the parish for a conditional purchase. And also the conditional purchase number. Why do we have both registers and cards for the conditional purchase tenure? And is there an overlap? Could other land tenures be converted to conditional purchase? And what research can I do from home? And finally, what do you actually need to come here to the New South Wales State Archives reading room to actually do? And what homework we'd like you to do before you come? So basically a conditional purchase was it's known as um, free selection before survey and basically you could go out there and start using the land after having paid a deposit of one quarter of the purchase price you then had to reside on the land and initially for three years by 1884 it was five years by 1895 it was 10 years you paid a deposit of one quarter of the purchase price, so you didn't get off scot-free, you actually had to have some money to start with. And you had to add improvements to the land to the value of one pound per acre. Two different types of conditional purchase. There's the original conditional purchase where you had to reside on the land, and then you can get other or additional conditional purchases where you were still living on your original conditional purchase. So lots of different initials showing up on maps, but generally if they've got CP, then there's some sort of conditional purchase. Occasionally, instead of CP, you see OCP. Two concepts that you might actually come across when you're reading about conditional purchase, dummying and peacocking. Peacocking was actually when one large landowner would select the best parts of the land to block other people getting access to the water. So you didn't need to own all the land behind your selections, you just controlled the water and people couldn't actually use that other land. Dummying is basically what was a way of actually circumventing what the Land Roberts, Robertson Land Acts were about. The Robinson Land Acts were basically trying to get people out onto the land, smaller um, settlers, and 
getting the land working as agriculture rather than being tied up in pastoral. And under dummying, a person might select some land, but then transfer it to the person who'd actually arranged for them to buy that land. This 1875 Act actually made dummying a criminal offence. Mineral conditional purchases, they were around until 1884 and they had to do with allowing you to mine on the land. So you'll occasionally come across that concept as well. Basically, the land could not be near a populated area. So it couldn't be town land, it couldn't be suburban land, it couldn't be within a proclaimed gold field or under lease to another person for mining, nor a reserved site for a town, a village or for a water supply. There were arbitration methods in case more than one purchaser selected the same land. You basically paid your quarter deposit, lived on it for at least three years making these improvements. And after that three years, you could either pay the rest of the money or you could actually pay it off at an annual fee with an interest rate. And sometimes, in fact, it's 20 or 30 years before the land finally becomes freehold title and is owned by the selector. Now, as I mentioned, your first conditional purchase was the one that you had to reside on. But if you did additional conditional purchases, then you didn't have to reside on them and because you were still living on your first one. And you also didn't have to do the same kind of improvements. So the main improvement for non-residential conditional purchases and additional ones was the fencing. And of course, the clearing of the land. This conditional purchase system operated from 1862 to 1898. So that's, that's nearly 130 years worth of legislation and 130 years worth of changes to how the Act operates. So conditional purchases are complicated because of those changes in time period. On the other hand, of course, the legislation is very specific in what you can and can't do with the land and how you can purchase the land. Now, conditional purchases start after the 1861 Robertson and Act, Land Acts. As I said, it was basically designed for two purposes. The first one was actually to get people out on the land, working the land, and not having the land tied up by a few big landholders and not necessarily being as productive as it could be. But there was also a problem because of the fact that the surveyors were really, really stretched and not getting the amount of work done that was required. So conditional purchases allowed you to go out and live on that land before the surveyors had actually done their survey. But there were lots of problems with the 1861 Act. And so you get the 1875 Act, and we'll talk about some of those problems in a minute. Then you get the 1884 Act, the 1895 Act, the 1903 Act, and then the 1912 consolidation. And from 1884, there are all these additional tenures, which start to look very complicated. And also New South Wales is divided into the Eastern, Central and Western divisions. And one of the differences is that the Eastern and Central, in fact, had, you could allow maximum pur purchases of differing amounts. I think mainly because of the climate and the agricultural ability of the central. With the Western Division, it was lease only. It was never freehold in this period. And conditional purchases last up until past the 1989 Act. So the 1989 Act says that you can't have any new conditional purchases, but any of the conditional purchases created before then were allowed to play out until they were finally made freehold. So what size portions could you get? Well, the smallest portion was 40 acres. Under the 1861 Act, the largest portion was 320 acres. The 1875 Act increased that to 640 acres. The 1884 Act increased the central division maximum to 2,560 acres. 
and the 1913 Act extended the maximum for the Eastern Division to 1,280 acres. Therefore, when you're doing land history, family history, you often find that the property that people are referring to is actually comprised of a number of different portions, which may in fact have been taken out as conditional purchases or as additional conditional purchases at differing times. Question I'm often asked is how much did the land cost? And the answer is one pound per acre. That was the amount that was actually set in the 1861 Acts. And that's virtually the amount of land, the amount that continued all the way through until definitely the 1912, 13 Acts. So here you see two examples of conditional purchase correspondence. John McPhillamy is getting 50 acres for 50 pounds and Donald McPherson, who is actually mortgaging the land and therefore the name of the commercial banking company appears on the records, is getting 100 acres for 100 pounds. You can also see from these the actual time period that they were being paid off. So John McPhillamy, 1875 selection, but not paid off till 1903. Donald McPherson, 1883 selection, but not paid off till 1910. Question we often get asked, what were the restrictions? What age restrictions were there? Now, one problem with the 1861 Act was that there was no age or gender restrictions. The legislation did not define what a person was. As a result, children obtain conditional purchases when their parents apply for them. But the improvement still had to be made and the residential qualifications still applied. So various acts after this tried to actually correct this. The 1875 Act said that it could only be done by people 16 and up, and that every person had to apply, every applicant had to apply in person to the local land, act, land agent. And if the person applying was under 21, so 16 to 21, they had to state in the application how old they were. And if the statement was untrue, the conditional purchase became void and the deposit was forfeited. And by 1872, Vicky points out that in fact, the conditional purchase registers do show um, by a notation in red that the owner was a minor or under the age of 21. Now the 1884 Act is actually a bonus for family historians because it was really tightening up on the, who the applicant was and it requires so much more information. So after the 1880, if the conditional purchase was taken out after 1884, you should get an application, should is always the operative word, but you should get an application such as name, age, date of birth, marital status, residence for the last two years, employer for the last two years, and lots of questions that actually are trying to ascertain and stop dummying, saying that it's only for your land use. You don't have an interest with another person. You don't have any sort of understanding or an obligation that would actually mean that the land is not being purchased for you, but for somebody else. And also details of other conditional purchases that you already have. Now, this is a, a case study from Terry Cass of Ellen Aidy Jenkins. Ellen was born in 1862 and she was the daughter of a licensed surveyor. Very precocious young lady at the age of one in 1863, she selected 40 acres of land. In 1864, her father actually surveyed the land of portion four in the parish of Currawong and stated that it was suitable and that the residential conditions had been fulfilled. So this implies that Ellen was actually living on the land in the four room slab hat, sl slab hut, my apologies, uh, that included a kitchen, wells and a garden. Total improvements were 65 pounds. At the age of four, Ellen transferred her conditional purchase to Patrick McCabe, who coincidentally was the cattle manager for James Roberts, the local large landowner. And in 1869, he transferred the conditional purchase to James Robert. 
So if you actually look at the Crown Plan, in red you can see James Roberts and the correspondence number that Terry has used here for the information. But underneath there you can see the name of Ellen Age Jenkins. And she was not alone. There are apparently quite a few young children who had conditional purchases in this period. Now, the 1875 Act didn't stop minors having conditional purchases because they could still have them if they inherited them. So say their father died and they were actually the heir to the estate, then they would still be able to get the conditional purchase. There are other provisions um, through the later acts that become more specific. So for example, under the 1884 Act, if the original holder was declared insolvent or a lunatic or was a patient in a mental hospital, then representatives or official assignees could hold that conditional purchase in trust for them. And those representatives didn't have to reside on the conditional purchase. And under the 1889 Act, males 16 to 21 and females under 24, if they held a conditional purchase that was adjoining their parents, they could actually live on their parents' property and still fulfill their own residential qualifications. And it's not spelt out in any of the early uh, legislation, but under the 1895 Act, aliens who applied, so non-British subjects who applied for an additional purchase, had to lodge a declaration to say that they planned to apply for British citizenship within five years of applying for the land. And if they didn't actually get naturalised, then they could forfeit the land. Now, women and conditional purchases. Unmarried women over 16 could, contain, could obtain an original conditional purchase, and that was later raised to 18. Women could retain their conditional purchases. So a woman who was judicially separated from her husband could also get a conditional purchase. And we're not just talking about divorce, but also women who were registered under the Zerted Wives Act as being femme souls. In other words, able to manage their own money, not liable for their husband's debts, and the husband couldn't take any of their money or their land. Now, under the 1889 Act, if a woman had an original conditional purchase, and it's well, she was single, and then she married, she continued to own that land in her own right. And she could apply for other additional conditional purchases or conditional leases because she already had an original conditional purchase. She doesn't have to live on her land while her husband lives on his land. She could actually live on her, on her husband's land and that would still complete the residential qualifications or the act did allow him to live on her land and that way he completed his uh, residential qualifications. Question I often got asked was whether or not conditional purchases could be sold. They can't actually be sold because they're still Crown land, so they have not been alienated from the Crown, but they could be transferred and they could be mortgaged. And these documents are available on the Historical Land Record Viewer in the old system records. And the Historical Land Record Viewer is available on the New South Wales Land Registry Services website. Now, the strange thing here is that all that information before the conditional purchase land becomes freehold is in the old system record. But once the conditional purchase is completed and becomes freehold, it is in the Torrens title records. If you're not familiar with these terms, I'd recommend you have a look at our webinars on land, which do talk about use of crown plans, use of parish maps, and also the differences between Torrens title and old system. Now on the Historic Land Record Viewer, there is an index from 1896 to conditional purchases, but it's not an index to all conditional purchases. It's only an index to those mortgages and transfers being recorded by the Registrar General. That stop, starts 1896, stops 1967, but you can still find those mortgages and transfers earlier than that via the actual old system vendors index using only the name of the holder. And this becomes part of the problem because the vendors index is only the sellers index, even though, sorry, I know these aren't sales, but anyway, therefore you can't get it 
easily under both names. And if it's gone from the holder to a bank, finding it coming from the bank back to the holder can be a little bit difficult because banks hold so much land. So here's an example, which is James King in the parish of Dubbo, County of Lincoln. And when you looked at the actual um, conditional purchase registers for James King, it was very, very confusing because it was referencing in those registers to a number of transfers. So it goes to George Taylor, William Moffat and Edwin Edwins. Then it comes back to James King. Then it went to a Robert Booth. And then it went from James King to AF Salter, but there's no reference to Booth. But when you actually have a look at these notifications of transfers of conditional purchase in the New Historic Land Record Viewer, it becomes clear that some of these transfers are because of mortgages. As in nowadays, when you get a mortgage, the bank holds your deeds and you don't get them back until after you've paid it off. So the switching backwards and forwards are mortgages. The final transfer to Salter is an actual transfer and it's Salter's name who shows up on the parish maps. So I've just done this little grid so you can sort of see the kind of thing I'm talking about. Mortgages do not have to be to banks. Sometimes they can be to individuals or it could be that George Taylor, Taylor, William Moffat and Edwin Davies were actually the trustees of a local bank or a local building society. And here's an example of one of those transfers of conditional purchase. This is the final one for from James King to Salter. Gives you all his certificate of, of sorry, his conditional purchase numbers, talks about the dates and the county and the parish and so on and so forth. And right up in the corner, it actually gives you the CS, in other words, the conditional sales branch of lands, their letter number, which is 98 slash 3002. The first number being the year. And this is just an example of the cross indexing by these two different government departments. So in the correspondence for Mary Ellen Maxwell's deceased husband, James Maxwell, for his conditional purchase, which is at letter number conditional sales 94 slash 2515. It tells you the Volfol. It tells you the old system number 532 slash 354. And when you go to that number, right up in the corner, very, very faint, you've got the conditional sales lands branch correspondence number. So one way of getting into the correspondence can be through these transfers of mortgages. So how do you know if your ancestor had a conditional purchase? How do you find out information such as the portion number, the, the conditional purchase number and so on and so forth? There's a lot of different sources. Some are better than others, but sometimes you need to use more than one. So there's an index to conditional purchase registers, 1862 to 65. There's the parish maps, we'll see examples of these. The numbers show up in the government gazettes, which are on trove. There may be reports in the newspapers, not necessarily with the numbers, but it would give you a clue as to the parish and the time period. Even some Torrens title certificates on the Historic Land Record Viewer show this conditional purchase number. Wills in probates packets. The gold standard is the deceased estate files. These are valuations of the estate for the payment of stamp duty to the New South Wales government from the 1880s to the 1950s. But, big but, the person has to still own the land at the time they die for it to show up in the deceased estate files. And of course, there's always family stories. And then there are the records we hold, such as the conditional purchase registers and tenure cards. So here's an example from the Index to Conditional Purchase Registers, 1862 to 65, indexed by person's name, indexed by um, conditional purchase number, and for the very first couple of years, also indexed by county and parish. So here we have James Symington, sorry, John Symington, having conditional purchase number 63-2688. And when you go to that number in the index, it says that John Symington has it from 1863. It tells you the Crown Plan number 202-1660. And it then says that John Moore took it over from 1867. So here we have the conditional purchase register 
it gives us this same detail. It tells us the crown plan as well. And it gives a letter number for that um, transfer to John Moore. And here is the crown plan. Crown plan also gives us a letter number in the alienation branch. It shows us where the hut was that John Symington had built. And in fact, if you look at the parish maps, you do not get John Symington's name on this portion because the first edition we've got is 1899. Sorry, the first one that's up on HLRV is 1899. It's actually the second edition. But by that time, the land was now freehold and owned by John Moore. So all the information about the conditional purchase registers, etc., conditional purchase numbers has vanished off the plan. An important reason why when you're looking at, at parish maps, you look at every parish map and compare the information on each one. So here, for example, we have two editions of the parish map for Castlereagh in the county of Leichhardt. And you will notice on the earlier ones, if we look at portion 38, it's telling us that it's conditional purchase 89-7 and it's by Arthur Stirling, Stirling Barton. And in fact, Barton also has 39. Now, by the time you get to 1933, the land has become freehold, but it has been mortgaged at the time it became freehold. So instead of Barton's name, we now get the fact that it's owned by the Commercial Banking Company of Sydney. Still get your um, Crown Plan numbers. Still get, um, and in fact, on number 38 in the 1933 edition, written on the actual portion, you're getting the Vol Fol, which are those little numbers after underneath Sydney, but you're not getting Arthur Sterling Barton's name showing up on his land. Another way might be if you're working backwards, you might have already got the Vol Fol. Over in the left hand corner, you can see that the conditional purchase number and the conditional purchase land district, which is Walgett, has in fact been written so that this will take you backwards as well as taking you forwards to what happened to the land from 1924 onwards. And of course, these are available on the Historic Land Record Viewer on the New South Wales Land Registry Services website. Looking now at the Crown Plans for portion 38. I love Crown Plans and I again recommend that you have a look at our Fun with Crown Plans webinar. It shows you the kind of vegetation, it shows you the um, bit about the soils, gives you a correspondence number for the finalisation of the, um, the portion to the Commercial Banking Company of Sydney. And just a reminder that you get the Crown Plan number off the parish map and you then have to come out here to State Archives Reading Room to actually look at them or you can order them online from the information brokers on the New South Wales Land Registry Services website. Here we have the tenure cards for these tenures. And again, you're getting crown plan numbers, you're getting portion numbers, you're getting the names, you're getting the date applied for when it was confirmed, and you're getting the correspondence number. Now, in this case, it's a different correspondence number to what we had on the previous one. That was a 1924, I think, number. This is an 1892 number, and it actually is aligned to the date that the Certificate of Conformity was issued in 1892, which is when basically three years or so after the, um, I think that one actually might've been five years residence. So basically when the residence qualification has been fulfilled. And sometimes it can be much, much easier to see which correspondence number you need from the tenure card than from the, the register, because there's an awful lot of correspondence numbers in each register entry, but I've outlined in purple where it says certificate issued and the number 95-925 DEP, which is the where it is most likely, never guarantee, but it's most likely that the bulk of the correspondence will be filed. In earlier time periods, that number that was on the Crown Plan might have got you the bulk of the correspondence. So you have to be a bit flexible with these things, because as I said, over 100 and 
30 odd years, things change. Probate packets can certainly let you know that there is some land in issue, but they may not necessarily give you the um, exact details. It might tell you the parish, as this one does, tells you the name of the estate, but doesn't actually give you portion numbers. Deceased estates, on the other hand, are fantastic. They will give you portion numbers, they will give you conditional purchase numbers, and sometimes they even give you the vol foal numbers. So really, really worthwhile if you can get a deceased estate. As I said, as long as the person who owned the land died owning the land. Now here we have the, again, this is relating to land by John Street. So we've got a number out of the conditional purchase register on Microfish. Interestingly enough though, we do not have a Crown Plan number in that list. But we've also got the fact that this is a lapsed conditional purchase from the New South Wales Government Gazette. And the New South Wales Government Gazette gave us the number of the CP, gave us his name, the area, but it also included the correspondence number. So that's a clue for us to go on with. And when we've gone to the correspondence, written in the correspondence, in that lovely handwriting is in fact the crown plan number. So everything indexes everything else. There's multiple ways to get into these inf information and there's no necessarily start here or start there because you can follow things through from a variety of different starting places. And I know that you've seen this letter previously if you've looked at my um, Fun with Crown Plans webinar. But I do love this letter. The reason why it's a lapsed conditional purchase is stated in this letter. He purchased the land at Casino in October 1864. Well, he applied for it. I went in search of the land selected by me and could not find it after searching for seven days. And not being any surveyor here at the time, I could get no tidings about it. And I have never seen the land yet. Since I received your letter, I've been to surveyor. He tells me it is a barren rock piece of land and no good for anything, about two miles in a different direction to where I thought it was. Signed, John Street. This is definitely selection before surveying. So why are there both registers and cards and is there any overlap? Well, starting in 1906, the Public Service Board decided to introduce the card system to increase efficiency in record keeping, basically to save money and to save staff time. It was actually easier to keep the records up to date. Where you had registers, as long as one of the entries was still active and was still a conditional purchase, then those registers had to stay in the outer office. Whereas with cards, you could actually go through and cull and get rid of the dead or also known as spent cards from the cabinet. And you would only ever have the up-to-date cards at your fingertips, not having to look through lots and lots of stuff that was no longer in use. Now, some tenures only ever exist on cards, such as those introduced by the Crown Lands Act. But there are other tenures which their branch did not start using the card system until 1911. So between this 1907 and 1911 period, you would still have to look at the registers for conditional purchases. And frankly, transcribing the registers into cards took an awfully long time. So in fact, it's not till 1915 that they've finished copying information from the conditional purchase registers to the card. So during that period, you could in fact have 10 years conditional purchases in the registers that finished and they wouldn't have created a new card for them. You could have ones that were ongoing and therefore they are both in the register and in the card. And the registers get noted with the fact that they've created a card either by putting the word card or a red C or a red tick. So if you're looking for a conditional purchase completed before about 1911, it may only be in the registers. If you're looking for a conditional purchase started after about 1916, it may only be on card, but some CPs will be in both. And it's not a bad idea to look at them because the, the cards actually make it much clearer 
where the correspondence is going to be. And here we have some examples from Walgett and you can see the little C and the red tick. So 1889, 11, 12 and 16 have gone on to cards and you can't quite see it but 15 has as well. Whereas 13, 14 and 17 have not gone on to cards. And you can see the cards over on the other side jumping from 12 to 15 and from 16 to 18. From 1862 to 1874, the conditional purchase registers are by year and then they've got an annual running number. There are no indexes to these individual registers, except they do give you page numbers for certain districts. After 1875, the registers are arranged by land district and they do have individual indexes in the front of each volume organised by year. So if you're doing a local history, for example, you can sort of select, say, the Armadale conditional purchase registers and go through those from 1875 onwards, looking at individuals in particular parishes. Therefore, it is vital when you come to do the registers with us at State Archives that you've looked at the parish map and you've taken note of the land district, which is written under the title of the parish map, the parish for which your conditional purchase shows up. And they do change over time as well. Other land tenures could be converted conditional purchase. And here's an example from Tamora, where conditional purchase 37.7 was originally conditional purchase 12.30, and it was subdivided. But before it had been conditional purchase 12.30, it was special lease 7.19. And then in 1949, it was purchased by the Crown anyway. So the family story may say that the family has been on the land since the 1870s, but you can only find the conditional purchase from the 1880s. Maybe they held it under a different tenure in that earlier time period. Binding correspondence is the most frustrating part of the whole conditional purchase experience, but it can also be the most rewarding. The correspondence can include applications, inspectors reports, maps, letters, and so on and so forth. Here, for example, for conditional purchase 7574 at Bathurst, we have a letter from Rankin, who in, ends up is the local landholder and ends up purchasing this conditional purchase from McCudden. But we get a letter explaining about the fact that he was actually leasing land to McCudden and there was a road came through it and that destroyed the piece of land as a farm. So McCudden sort of said to him, look, I'm going to go and do a conditional purchase. Will you lend me the money to do it? And Rankin did. But then McCudden, whether because he still had a hut on the property that he was originally leasing or whether because he didn't understand where the boundaries were, actually set up his residence not on the conditional purchase land. The result of which was that his conditional purchase was forfeited. But because they thought it was an honest mistake, they actually reinstated it and the whole process took off again. So correspondence can find you some very interesting things. Not easy, may involve a lot of time at State Archives reading room, but may be worth it. Did conditional purchase work? Here are some maps from Stephen Roberts' History of Australian Land Settlements suggesting that it, it did open up areas of New South Wales and it did push agriculture. For example, the bottom map shows the wheat belt out and increase agriculture. And this one from the same source shows what land was under wheat in 1860 and how the wheat zones had extended in 1884. I know maybe that it, not everybody used their conditional purchase to grow cabbages, but I'm sorry, I just love this photo. It's such a great one. So, yep, I don't know. Maybe some did conditional purchases did grow cabbages, but they certainly would have grown malting barley and they certainly would have grown corn. So what can you do from home? You can look at the newspapers. You can look at the government gazettes and they're all available on Trove. You can definitely look at the parish maps and I would recommend every edition of the parish maps, not just the oldest. 
and they're of course on the historic land records viewer at the land registry services website you can look at the transfers and mortgages under the vendors index and under the conditional purchase index for your person's name and you can look at the Torrens title certificates and if you haven't got the number for the Torrens title it normally shows up on the LTO charting map on the historic land record viewer so don't just look at the historical parish maps look also at the charting maps as well but you need to come to state archives at Kingswood for the conditional purchase registers for the tenure cards the correspondence I did mention that it's 130 years worth of correspondence so different departments at different times and to view the crown plans on the historical land record viewer now crown plans can be purchased from the information brokers um, and you can do that from home we can't supply you with copies of them our reading room is at 161 O'Connell Street and you can check on our website for opening hours and do if you're coming for correspondence or even registers do allow and tenure cards sorry do allow lots of time and unfortunately we can't guarantee success when trying to find the correspondence and of course the websites that are out there there's Trove there's the historical land record viewer on the New South Wales land registry services site if you're interested in the legislation and the various toing and froings and what happened with the um, conditions there is legislation available on the New South Wales legislation website and there are often reports about conditional purchases and about land generally particularly around 1863 on the parliamentary papers votes and proceedings and they're available on the parliament website there is a guide to conditional purchases on our website and I would also recommend of course Dr Terry Cass's book Unlocking Land which I have been reading faithfully for the last week or so and found quite a few facts that I didn't actually know myself. So back to you, Emily. Thanks, Jenny. Wow. Um, I was just thinking as you were talking about a couple of different things. One, I just love it when the numbers work out. That is my most favourite thing with the conditional purchase <laughs> records, I think. Well, it's so frustrating. Uh, it's so frustrating when people come in day after day and then it doesn't work out. Yep, absolutely. Because somebody misfiled it back in the office in 1900 or something. Yes. Yes. And the other thing, as you were describing people transcribing the registers and it took three years, I was just thinking of, did they employ clerks and their job was just to sit there and write these cards up, which I'm sure they probably did because how else would you get it done? And um, is, it, is it totally accurate? You probably need to look at both records just to make certain. Yes. Yes. And, and the photo of the cabbage, I think, is now my new favourite photo in the collection. Just, <laughs> just say. <laughs> um, so I also have some questions that were sent in to us in advance. We've had three come through. And the first one that I've got is a little bit of a different side of the whole issue of conditional purchases. This comes from Maureen. And she says her great great grandfather John Delaney was a commissioner of conditional purchases appointed on the 1st of September 1875. Um, do we have any records Ray, the areas where he worked? What would his work have been? Um, how would he have been employed and how did his term end? So I've got some general answers because I couldn't find anything specific uh, there Maureen but we do know there were people called commissioners of conditional purchases so it was a role that was attached to the secretary for lands as part of the conditional sales branch um, and this was a position that came into being under the 1875 act and their job basically was to look into charges against conditional purchases. So things like people not fulfilling conditions as to living on the land or improving the land. The cases were heard in open court and the commissioner had to report back to the minister about each claim or complaint. So I assume that correspondence would be present as part of the general conditional sales branch correspondence there. 
we think they might have been similar to that same level as justices of the peace in that they could summon witnesses and administer oaths. But these positions, this Commissioner of Conditional Purchases was replaced by the land boards under the 1884 Act. So it didn't last particularly long. This is just a snip from the Act itself, which is talking about these commissioners and what they did. And then we've got a snip from a government gazette, which is just looking at a report about the commissioners of the conditional purchases doing their job, sort of making inquiries there. Unfortunately, they don't necessarily always say which commissioner was doing the inquiring. And here, finally, we've got the public service list. So we've got a public service list from 1876. We've got, where is he? Where is he? John Delaney there. Um, and you can see he's employed in 1875. And then when we go to 1882, we can see that the other commissioners are there, but John Delaney is no longer listed as a commissioner. So I would say that that's probably about the year that he resigned. Um, again, perhaps there'd be correspondence among the papers of the um, sales branch of the lands department, but we didn't quite have enough capacity to check that out, unfortunately. Thank you for that question. That was a really good question that we didn't know about before. We've also had a question from Amanda about conditional purchases in town areas. And she was particularly interested in Campbelltown, Eds and Wagga Wagga. But I can see also too on the questions today that Mark's asked about um, whether there would be CPs issued in Sydney and he's thinking particularly Petersham. So these questions kind of work out hand in hand together. Um, so the first thing to note is that Conditional purchases were always acreage. I think, Jenny, the smallest area you could get was 40 acres. Yes, that's right. And you had to be a certain distance from the town area. So it's unusual to, well, actually, you wouldn't get a conditional purchase in a town area like Eds or Campbelltown or Wagga, but they'd be on the outskirts. And what you'd have to do, I think, is to possibly start with your parish map to see what you could see. So here I've got um, a page from the Geographical Names Board thinking about Wagga. What was the parish name for Wagga? It's South Wagga Wagga. So then I could look at a parish map for South Wagga Wagga. And parish maps really work as an index to land records. Terry Cass has said this to me over and over again over the years. So acts as an index to the records, way into the records. It's a picture index, if you like. And if I blow it up, I can see here we've got the town of Wagga and it's all laid out with its lovely little streets and things. But you have to start looking around the edges of the town to start to see if you can pick up some of those references to conditional purchases. And I think particularly with those Sydney areas, a lot of that area was just granted before 1862. So a lot of that would be earlier land grants that would have been acreage. But I think that a lot of those town or those lands near those settled areas, it, the land would have been settled too early to have been opened up to conditional purchase. So then with Wagga, it's actually, you've got to go sort of right to the edge of the parish before you start to see some of these conditional purchases. And then we've got just a few there from 1868, 66. So even quite early on in the piece there, um, but it's just a matter of looking around. And then, um, you might sort of extend your search to look through other parishes that are nearby. So here we've got, always on the parish map, you can see what the next parish across is. So here we've got Erin Quinty. Um, we can see that the county name is County Mitchell. And so you can widen your search that way. And you can do that from home on the HLRV. Okay, so, and then you could go, the other thing you could do, of course, is to go back to the conditional purchase register 
as we were talking earlier. So the registers after 1874 are arranged by land district and then each one is indexed in the front. And, you know, you could browse, you could look through the index for the names or you could just go through the registers. Always in the register it tells you the details of who took the CP out, the parish name and also the county name there, as well as the portion number. So the records tie you back to the plans every single time, the parish maps, sorry, every single time. Just to add the comment that you also get in the registers, the Crown plan number. Yes, yes, I was looking for that on this one. Oh, and I couldn't see it, but it's this column here, catalogue number of plan. So that's that squiggle there is actually a Crown plan number, believe it or not. Okay, so the third question that we had was from Peter, who has family property in the parish of Bimelo, which is in the county of Westmoreland. And so he had a few different blocks in which he was interested and some of those were conditional purchases and some of them weren't. So did the same thing, went back to the parish map. That was the first thing that I did. Um, blew up the area that I was looking for. So Peter was interested in portions 64, 65, and a third one, which is 61. Here we've got 65 and 64, and you can see the CP numbers there, 71, 3708, and 72, 4854. So these were CPs that were done when the registers were still set out by the whole state being listed together. So from this, because I've got these numbers from the parish map, I could then go to the register. And here we've got that 73873, and we've got his conditional purchase entry there. And that's, as Jenny explained before, you can read that and that's a record of what's happened with the conditional purchase, but you've got, also got the ability to use the correspondence numbers on the page there to trace through the correspondence. And that, as we said earlier, is a lengthy task, no guarantee of success, but very rewarding if you can get that far. And then here's a different con register with the other register. So we've got 4854 John Maxwell. We can see where the area was and we can see under that the details of the transfers there. So that was quite interesting. Now, Peter also had some records that were earlier. Um, so these were for earlier portions. And these were for portions one, four and 32. Okay, no, sorry, not up to that yet. Um, but if you came to the tabley thing on the parish map, you will also see that it gives you information about each of the portions. So we had portion 64 and 65. We've got um, the volume and folio numbers there. So that can take us to the Torrens title register. And we've also got the parish, sorry, the portion plan number there as well, those two portion plans. And that can give us some more information about those blocks. So quickly looking at the portion plan there, we can see we've got the the details of the correspondence when it was finally taken out. We can see that it was originally taken out under the Alienation Act by John Maxwell um, and that it's been transferred subsequently. Um, and here's the portion plan for the other block that we'd been looking at as well with similar details. And then if you go to the Torrance Title Register, you can see that here. And often, but unfortunately not in this case, they'll often give you the conditional purchase number on this document to get you back to those other records. So it all sort of ties in together in a beautiful, beautiful way. Um, and we've got a, a detailed physical description of this Torrance Title, which can consists of both of the portions that were originally taken out as separate conditional purchases, which ties in again, Jenny, with what you were saying, that um, a big block might be broken up into little conditional purchases and then come back together again. And the third block, portion 61, um, was also one that Peter was interested in. And this, according to both the parish map and the, the portion plan here, was 
transferred back to the Metropolitan Water Sewerage and Drainage Board um, and that happened in 1963. So you get the full story there of in a, a few broad brush strokes of what happened um, and that's quite interesting. Okay, <laughs> I was just reading one of the questions. Denise says, will we show the cabbage photo again? We will before we finish, I promise. <laughs> Um, now, I just want to jump forward to just quickly another side of things. So, Peter had also identified some portions on the parish map with quite early numbers, portion one and portion four and 32. So, these were earlier. And when I went to the tabley thing on the parish map, I could see that we had parish plan numbers here, portion plan numbers for one, four and five. Uh, three, four and 32. So I looked up the portion plans for those. Um, I couldn't see one because it wasn't actually digitised and available online, online, but this was portion four. See the little four there? Um, and it tells us that it was purchased a lot earlier than 1860. Two, it was purchased in 1852. So immediately that tells me this, this cannot be a conditional purchase because it was purchased before 1862. Um, and it tells us the date of the land sale there. And then similarly with the other block of land sold in 1858. So for these ones, you can go back to the HLRV and look up the old system grant register and the grant indexes, and you can actually look up the sale. So we've got Timothy Lacey, purchasing um, 30 acres of land in the old system grant index. And then that takes us back to this land purchase document. And this is the document of him purchasing that first land in 1852. And then doing the same thing in the grant index, but a little bit later in 1858, we see a similar index entry. And then it's possible to use these numbers, the serial and page numbers to then find the purchase document of that land in 1859. So all of that information really came to me by looking at first the parish map, which you can do online at home, and then playing around with the old system indexes um, to find those old system documents. The crown plans, we have access to view those here in our reading room at Kingswood. But other than that, you must go to the land registry services and purchase a copy of the plan. So if you're in the reading room, you can look at it and get the information off it. And you can also check out that it's the one that you want if you think considering purchasing it, but we can't provide you with copies of those. They haven't made those copies available anywhere else and they're only available in our reading room. So other than that, we've got a few questions to answer um, that have come through from the webinar today. So the first question, is the index to conditional purchase registers available online? And if not, where can the microfish be inspected? Asked Peter. Basically, it's on microfish. Most, we certainly have a copy here, but I would imagine it was also sold to other local uh, libraries, maybe family history societies. State Library, I would suspect, have it as well. It was done, it's not one of our indexes, therefore we can't put up indexes um, that are copyright to other people on our website. So at this stage, it's a matter of locating who has the microfish. Alan says, just to confirm, are any of the correspondence series digitised or do they generally have to be viewed in person at the reading room? Sorry, Alan, it's an in-person job, this one. Except for the parish maps and the old system grant registers and the index to conditional purchases that Jenny was talking about on the HLRV, that 1896 to what year does that go to? Uh, 1960 something, 69 perhaps. 1960 something. Just to say that um, there are webinars up on the State Library of New South Wales' website on how to use HLRV. So people might also be interested in having a look at those as well. Next thing is from Denise, who says, do you still hold records for land that was in New South Wales prior to separation of other states pre-1850s? And where else could you look? My suspicions are, I'm pretty, that in fact, um, it's the records would have been in the Melbourne office. And when separation happened, 
then I'm pretty certain they, the records stayed in Melbourne. Um, have a look on the Public Records Office of Victoria website. If they don't actually have them, then they would, I'm sure that they've got actually a guide up on how, where to find them. <laughs> Looking for your cabbage photo. <laughs> add in add in NRS dash four four eight one dash four. Four. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I don't think we hold, we do hold little bits and pieces. Um, sometimes there's lists and things that come through of records from that were part of New South Wales, but now sort of a really other states. Mostly you'd need to go to that other state as it is now. Alexis says, when was Hansard started as a record? I'm at definitely 1856 onwards. Votes and Proceedings, Parliamentary Papers is about 1903, but there's an overlap. But Hansard, I would have suggested definitely 1856, may even earlier than 1856. I know that there is material on the Parliamentary web website. That's www.parliament.nsw.gov.au. If you go to Hansard and House Papers and then use the heading Comprehensive Indexes, you can get into them or you can also go in by date. But very interesting, some of the stuff that gets published, particularly in those parliamentary papers and votes and proceedings, things that you'd never expect to be in there. Julie says she's got a borrowed copy of Dr. Cass's book. Um, where could she buy a copy? If you um, Google Dr. Cass, you'll get his contact details and it can be purchased directly from him. Di points out that the Wagga Wagga CP listed stated the land was Aboriginal and that's usually not acknowledged. So that's ah, something very interesting. I'll yeah, have to go yeah. back and look at that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and Sharon said, can you view primary applications at Kingswood? And yes, you can. She also says, have we indexed any land records that haven't been released as yet? I'm not sure. I think all of our efforts at the minute are sort of going to deceased estate files and some of those sorts of records and rehousing those files as far as I can tell. Have you got any update on that? No, I'm, I'm not certain. No. Uh, will the answers be available as part of the webinar library as they're so helpful to, for the researchers? We don't usually put the questions up because they're a little bit ad hoc and messy. Uh, Suzette says, what does it cost to purchase a map? Um, we're not sure because that's a transaction that happens through Land Registry Services New South Wales if you're thinking of the portion plans or also the parish maps, um, anything that's displayed on the historical lands records viewer, that's actually records that you can purchase from Land Registry Services New South Wales. The um, parish maps you can actually download from their website, but definitely the crown plans, the portion plans have to be purchased. There are a number of different um, information brokers and it's a matter of you ring them up and asking them what their fees are. And Stephen says the old system land grants ven and vendors index does include records for Victoria, Queensland and New Zealand prior to about 1855. So definitely prior to separation. Thanks, Stephen. Um, Susie says definitely try for Victorian records, the PRO Victoria, Public Records Office Victoria's website, which is PROV vic.gov.au. Um, they definitely hold old land records since they commenced in Victoria and they've got some digitised versions of these available to search in the reading room of the Public Records Office Victoria in North Melbourne. Di says, will the session go online? Yes, they will. Okay, so Lucy says she wasn't able to find the land's webinars. They're not too hard to find. You do have to have a look, we'll just do a bit of a live, quick live demo. If also, if you go to Research A to Z and Lands. All right, we'll do that first. And Research A to Z, yep. L for and Lands. Lands. And go into Land and then go down to, on the left-hand side, Other Resources, All Land Resources. Click on that and you get everything. So you get the indexes, you get the guides, and if you keep going down, you'll eventually see 
and for some unknown reason the crown land is the last of the lot okay so you have to go down a lot but um the ones that jenny did that we were talking to earlier there's finding certificate of land title numbers how to read a parish map reading certificates of title versus torrens titles so old system versus torrens the sketchbooks evaluation roles keep going down there's your down, one down. On, there's your one on the pre-1856 land tenures as well which is useful very very useful oh thank you um Still going down. Oh, crown plants. There we are. It is actually it's literally right at the bottom and you have to go down a long way. Okay. Stephen says, if you attend the land, New South Wales Land Registry Services in person, copies of, I assume, crown plans can be obtained for $15.80 each. They do them in A3 or A4 in full colour or black and white. So it's not a digital copy. It's a physical copy. And he said these would be paper copies, whereas if you went through an end of uh, information broker you'd get copies of a crown plan as a PDF so that's useful to know if you front up to the to the office you'll get a, a, a copy a physical copy a3 or a4 but if you go through an information broker and they do have contacts for information brokers on the LRS website then you'll get a PDF so I was just going to say it's just important to take your number with you you can't really look up the numbers at their office you need to know the number before you go and that's where the, the the historical parish maps really come into their own so if you don't know the parish I think step one is find out your parish name Andrew Redfern says that you can um, on the geographical names board website there is a place name search um, to find the parish name of an address so that's um, also what I was doing there with one of those slides, we did actually go into the geographical names board and that's the slide that came up to show where Wagga Wagga was and what the parish name was. Um, and also on the geographical names board site, if you persist, there is an, a copy of Gleason's place names as well, which is um, a list we think done in about the 1950s of lots of place names around New South Wales and what parish and land district and all of that that they're in. 